Thank you, Ram. It was interesting to hear that uh, my life story come from somebody else. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very grateful, very grateful for the invitation uh, to speak to all of you. Um, I'm always eager to speak to people in India about this subject, and I, I've had the opportunity in fact, I was in Ahmedabad um, in 2013 when my book, American Veda, came out in India. I did a tour and it included uh, parts of Gujarat and I was in 18 cities and, and I've been to India now many times. Uh, and every time I go, it reinforces the feeling I had a long time ago before I ever went to India that India was, in, in essence, my, my spiritual home. And uh, I still feel that way. And, and so I'm always eager to let people in India know, and people here, especially people in America of Indian descent, when I get the opportunity to speak to them, especially young people, and let them know uh, how much India's spiritual heritage has meant not just to me, uh, because my discovery of Vedanta and yoga and the, the, the whole tradition of Vedic insights and revelations um, it, it transformed my life. But it also transformed millions of other people's lives in America, and it's transformed many people's lives and, and, and significant parts of the culture uh, in such a way that many people don't even know they've been influenced by India but they have been, and I'll ex you'll see why I say that later. And, and that was, I think, one of, my, one of the important contributions of my book, of um, American Veda, was to uh, bring out the, the extent to which India's spiritual heritage has sh started to shape the culture and the spiritual landscape of America, especially in the last 40, 50 years. But the, as you'll see, the, the process has been going on for more than 200. Um, and it's especially meaningful for me now because of uh, the, what's going on in India, which is so heartbreaking to many of us who feel a deep connection to India. Uh, I was there when the pandemic started to break out last February and I was supposed to, I'm supposed to go back and of course those trips were canceled and I, I hope to be back in February but we'll see but um, anyway uh, thank you for the invitation in, in America we have a very often reputable, organizations do surveys of people's attitudes about things. And one of those areas is religion and spirituality. And if you look at the surveys over time, you see a, a discernible movement among Americans, especially young ones, toward an a, orientation to sp the spiritual dimension of life that is much more what we could call Hindu or Vedic or yogic than it is 
the conventional Western way of understanding religion and spirituality. This has been a, a gradual trend in American life, and it accelerates all the time. And the, the traits, the, the attributes that are identified in these studies are, for example, a sense of spiritual independence that um, individuals have an attitude of seeking and searching for their own approach, their own individual orientation toward the divine. And as opposed to the identification with a specific uh, tradition or a sect within a tradition or an organization. It's a, an orientation toward essentially um, the attitude that there are many paths to the divine as opposed to one exclusive orientation that my way is the only way and my church is the only truth and, and that sort of thing. This is very clear and it's very yogic. I always say that America is becoming a nation of yogis. And so the, 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 the uh, aphorism in, that comes all the way from the Rig Veda that uh, truth is one and the wise call it by many names is becoming a dominant attitude in America the attitude of seeking as opposed to membership or belonging, that they can seek the, the divine in many different ways and, and uh, find in other traditions than their own something of value. There's also a strong orientation now to the direct inner experience of of the divine, what Vedanta and yoga point us to, the, the inner experience of transcendence, of uh, awakening to the uh, truth of uh, what we truly are, to, to tattvam asi, to uh, the, the notion that um, we are divine beings, and that our uh, true self, the, the, the Atman, is uh, our ultimate identity. And that it is uh, possible to attain a certain a state of being, a state of consciousness, of unity with that which we call God or the transcendent or Brahman. And the people's notion of what the word God means and uh, what the uh, ultimate, what the infinite and eternal is, is much more like what uh, you would think of as Brahman than what in, in the West was the conven conventional notion of these things. All of this uh, is verifiable uh, trends that people have identified. And it's very clear from the history uh, that there are many factors that go into this, but one of them, if not the most important one, and I think it's the most important one, it's hard to prove, it, but you could see um, in, the his, in the historical uh, trend lines, that the more exposure to the teachings that were born in India, and so therefore include what we think of as Buddhism and all the, the variations of Hinduism, um, the more people are exposed to those, the more access they have, and that access, have, of course, grew over time with in, you know, improvements in technology and media and so forth, that 
the corresponding shifts in in American spirituality grow with uh, the access to the teachings. So that's the setup. How this came about is a fascinating, very good. So here is a familiar uh, image to all of you. One, the, these teachings have come to America and Europe as well, but I, I'm, I focus on America um, through many different sources. As you'll see, there are many different uh, streams and tributaries and rivers th through which the, the, the core teachings of the Veda came into American life. And one of them, the most important, was with the, the series of gurus, swamis, yogacharyas, who came here from India and spent time and had an impact. And the first and probably most important was uh, Swami Vivekananda. As uh, Now, I have to warn you all, you know, I wrote a 350-page book about all this. And so to, <laughs> to give a summary, uh, I have to control myself because every one of the people I'm going to talk about, I could speak about for an hour. And so I have to give you the short version. And if you want more, you know, of course you can, you can find it in my book and other sources. So Vivekananda, as you all know, uh, came to America in 1893 to speak at the uh, World's Parliament of Religions, which was part of an enormous World's Fair in Chicago. And the, the short version of that was that the, the organizers, some of the organizers of that parliament, which brought together representatives from many of the world's religious traditions, uh, they thought that the uh, result of the conference would be that people would, it would be obvious that their religion, which at that time was what we think of as Protestant, you know, the dominant religion in America, was the superior. And they had not anticipated that uh, a Swami from a country they considered primitive, representing a religion they considered backward, would steal the show. And Vivekananda became the star of, that, of the show. We probably wouldn't even remember the parliament if it were not for Vivekananda. And what, what emerged from the publicity he got, and of course, this is 1893, there, were, you know, there was no mass media, as we know, so it was all newspapers and journals and word of mouth. But people started wanting to see this person, and so they had to add the times when he spoke and he had to give some of his speeches twice because uh, too many people came and they had to repeat it because, of course, there was no internet. And I don't know how many of you have been to America or go to, or been to Chicago, but the, the site on which the parliament was held and the World's Fair was held is now one of the great art museums of America. And they've preserved the auditorium where Vivekananda spoke, and there's a commemoration of it here. And uh, many people from India and Indians in America go there as a kind of pilgrimage. Uh, so I invite you to do that if you're ever in Chicago. You'll find it very mm -hmm. moving. Um, Vivekananda had a huge impact. And of course, uh, he only was here a few years. And, and as you all know, he died tragically very young, 39. Um, but in those few years he was here, 
he lectured widely to the public. He started what he called, what in India, as you know, you know, as the Ramakrishna mission set, uh, headquartered in, in Bellarmut outside of Kolkata. Um, here it was called the Vedanta Society. And he started a few of the early centers and started training swamis in Bellarmut, some of whom came here to America to run the Vedanta centers and open new ones. And so eventually there was a Vedanta Society Center in most major cities in America, and there still are, and they're still active, still an important voice in America. But for the first part of the 20th century, they were the only ones and the swamis at the centers there were the, were the voice of uh, India's spiritual heritage in America. They were controversial. There's always been two kinds of Americans. One type welcomes the stranger, welcomes foreigners, is eager to hear from people with expertise like a, a swami or a guru, wants to learn from them, wants to be welcoming and hospitable and curious. And those are the people that were drawn to Swami Vivekananda and, and to all the subsequent gurus who came. But there was also, there's also another part of America that still exists that resists anything new, that sees uh, foreigners as a threat and sees people who represent ideas that are different from theirs, especially ideas that seem to clash with their own religious views as a threatening. And so Vivekananda and all the subsequent gurus who came met with great open arms by some people like me and with resistance from other people. And that's, that's part of the story that makes it so interesting. And he also left behind, uh, in addition to the centers and uh, Americans who he trained, uh, who, as, who were his disciples who carried on his work and the swamis who came here, um, he left behind written works including most important, I mean, there's a huge volume of, uh, of Vivekananda's writings and the talks that were transcribed into written form. But the four most influential slim books, he, he, he produced a book on each of the four yogic paths on bhakti, karma yoga, gyan, and raj yoga. The raj yoga book being the most popular and which is his uh, interpretation of Patanjali and Yoga Sutras. And they, they, those books had a huge influence and continue to. And I'll come back to the legacy of Vivekananda later. Uh, in 1920, the next most important guru came here, and that was uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. You can see behind me, uh, I wrote a biography of Yogananda a few years ago because his life story fascinated me. And he's a, a very important part of the uh, story I tell in American Veda. He was the, uh, the, one of the newspapers in America called him the, Amer the first superstar guru of the 20th century. And as I said, for the first part of the 20th century, the, the Swamis of the Vedanta Society in different cities were the main uh, source of Indian spiritual teachings. And then Viv uh, Yogananda came and representing his lineage, uh, a Kriya Yoga lineage, he was strongly influenced by Vivekananda's example. If you're in Calcutta, and I take tour groups, and, uh, and, and we visit the home that Yogananda's family settled in when he was uh, 
13 years old, where he spent his teenage years and his college years, and where his descendants or his brother's descendants still live. And, uh, and you can walk from there, a short walk to the Vivekananda Museum, which is built on the site where Vivekananda grew up, his family's home. And when Yogananda grew up in Calcutta in his, his important teenage years, the influence of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda was very, very strong in his life. And the example of Vivekananda having come to America was, was a, something he would emulate. And so he came here under interesting circumstances to America in 1920. And like Vivekananda, spoke at a conference. And in Yogananda's case, ended up making America his home for the rest of his life, with the exception of one year that he returned to India in, in 1935 and six. And he lived until 1952. So from age 27 until his death at 59, he was in America, mostly here where I live in Los Angeles. And his footprint his mark is extremely strong because like Vivekananda, he left behind Americans he trained to carry on his lineage and people from India and properties, centers and uh, ashrams in different parts of America, especially Southern California and a huge amount of written works. And in his case, later in his life, uh, recordings, videos and audio recordings that are, uh, you know, uh, capture his, his speaking style and his, his, his voice. But, but the books and the institutions carried on his work and still do to this day. And the most important piece of that was the book he's holding here in the slide, The Autobiography of a Yogi. And I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have either heard of it or read it. It was enormously successful publication. It was published in 1946 and is still selling thousands of copies a year. And the courses he established that may, he made available to the public are still being taught, There's still new devotees being born all the time. The impact of that book was enormous, especially in my generation of seekers, young seekers in the late 1960s and 70s. We all read it. We Here's my copy of it. I've had this with me since I read it in 1970. I moved many, many times in my young years, and this was always with me. It cost $5. I don't know how many rupees that would be. But um, in 1970, I didn't have $5. I was a young seeker. I didn't have any money. And um, so I always say that I must have borrowed this and never returned it to whoever I borrowed it from. And so writing bi a biography of him and, and speaking about him is my I'm repaying the karma of stealing somebody's book. And, and the book is still with me. It, I never became a disciple of his but he's one of the important influences on me and many, many thousands of other people, some of whom became devotees, some of whom moved on to other uh, lineages and other teachers, but he impacted many, many millions of lives, especially through the book. And then in the late 1960s, beginning in the mid-60s through the 1970s, 
there was there was a huge shift in American culture with my generation of young people, people born during and after World War II, who came of age at a time when, uh, as my as Ram said when he introduced me we were questioning everything. The Vietnam War was going on. There was uh, domestic uh, racial upheavals and, and a way of life and a way of understanding reality that many of us said, no, no, there must be a better way to live. There must be higher truths. There must be a different way of understanding ourselves and the universe. And we were seeking. And it just happened that at that time, uh, it was a time of mass media, it was a time of global transportation, and it was a time when certain people who we'll soon meet, uh, who are older than my generation, were extolling the, the virtues of Eastern philosophy, and especially of Vedanta and, and yoga philosophy and Buddhism, and we just were drawn to it. And in that context, a series of gurus came. And there were so many of them, I just put them all together in one uh, collage. And we don't have time to go into who they all were and what they all taught. But if you, and I, as I did in my book, if you look at the um, parade that came here, you see, they all represent a different sort of facet of the jewel that Vedic teachings represent. Different lineages, different emphasis, different teachings being brought out by each of these gurus who attracted different people. And they all left behind a legacy. They all left behind Americans they trained to carry on. They all left behind uh, institutions, buildings, uh, centers, in some cases ashrams, in some cases centers in urban settings or both. And a legacy of teachings that for the most part continue to this day. And they include among them, this is uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, many of you know, and, 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 and he, he would hate being in this group because <laughs> he didn't like gurus. And he was, a, he, like, he was an independent iconoclast. He didn't like religion. He didn't like tradition. He didn't like gurus. And he, he was busy denouncing all the gurus who became famous. And the more he denounced them, the more people treated him like a guru. And he would tell them not to, and they did anyway. <laughs> but he was very, very influential. His books, his uh, series of lectures that he gave in California every year, his uh, speaking engagements elsewhere. And he's influential to this day. But his teachings were at their heart. Uh, pure Vedanta. And next to him here is the person I spent many years with, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who became very famous in the late 60s uh, and became known as the Beatles guru. We'll come back to that in a minute. But um, at the time, from 1968 through the mid-70s, he was the most famous of the gurus worldwide. And his uh, sort of practical approach to uh, sadhana, to spiritual practice, centered on his transcendental meditation, which in India might be is typically called bhavati dhyan. And um, he... Uh, had a, an enormous, enormous impact in uh, bringing methods of meditation and by extension, all of the yogic practices uh, 
from something that only Americans thought strange people did, or you know, yogis in caves did, to something ordinary people could do and should do and can benefit from in their lives, not just on a spiritual level, but on a practical level uh, that people care about having, uh, you know, better health and well-being and all that. Yogananda did the same with his methods, but Maharshi came at a time when, you know, you could you can go on television and reach t tens of millions of people. And uh, went about training people, including young people like me, to teach others how to meditate. And, and it was a hugely successful uh, thing. And, and in, a, in less than 10 years, it went from uh, something that young, rebellious people like me were doing to something, you know, our parents could do and that doctors recommend it and all that because he uh, was a catalyst for scientists doing research on meditation practices and yogic practices and that scientific verification, the data and the publication in reputable journals moved these practices from the fringes of society and uh, counterculture people into the mainstream. We'll come back to that later, but that, that's, that's a big part of the story. Next to him is uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, uh, Srila Prabhupada, who, of course, brought the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavite tradition, what we call in America the Hare Krishnas, to America. And he came in the late 60s and uh, at the time was the only, you know, the, the bhakta, the, the, the bringing out the bhakti tradition of India. And, but at the time, the Americans he, tra he attracted, uh, you know, were... were uh, chanting uh, Kirtan and uh, the Krishna Maha Mantra in the streets and the parks of America, and everybody just thought they were weird <laughs> and weird hippies. Uh, but over time, people came to recognize uh, the bhakti tradition for its depth and its value, and many of those young hippies that he attracted uh, went on and, and to live you know, mainstream lives, and some of them became college professors and authors of books and so forth, and Kirtan became more widespread and popular, and so, you know, they had a big impact. Next to him is Swami Muktananda, who came to America in 1970, and then subsequently twice more, and he brought out uh, especially aspects of uh, traditions such as Shaktipat and the uh, Kundalini, understanding of Kundalini fo uh, focus and, uh, and Kashmir Shaivism and had an enormous impact and a huge numbers of, of following, uh, followers. And when he died in 1982, uh, his appointed successor, Gurumai, who we call Gurumai, uh, became really the first uh, important female uh, representative of, of India's spiritual traditions to, uh, to have um, a certain stature and a guru stature of her own. And she, in turn, drew a great number of people, especially young women who now had somebody they could identify with instead of the older men who were the gurus. And so she had a, a huge impact. And his Siddha Yoga lineage has had a big impact. And uh, this is Swami Satchidananda. I, I, I got them reversed. And this is Swami Vishnu Devananda. Um, and they too, they were both disciples of um, Swami Shivananda of Rishikesh and came here uh, teaching classical yoga. 
and uh, called it different names and taught it in different ways, the two of them, but they both had a big impact, especially Satchitananda, because he stayed in America uh, the, most of the rest of his life and established centers here and became very popular, very well-known figure. And um, they were the first two of the Indian uh, teachers to teach Hatha yoga systematically and to train what we now think of as American yoga teachers. In between them, for some reason, I messed up the order, is, of course, uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, a.k.a. Osho, who was the most um, controversial and provocative of them all and uh, had a, you know, has a mixed legacy of uh, transforming many, many lives with his sort of tantric-oriented methodologies and ideas and uh, also scandal. And there were scandals associated with others of the gurus as well, and I had to devote a lot of time to sorting that out in my books. I won't go into it all here, but suffice it to say, they were all human beings, all great teachers, and in some cases made some, uh, did some misbehaving. This is Amrit Desai, who came here as a householder and uh, artist and started teaching Hatha Yoga in the tradition of his teacher and then and became very famous and started a place called the Kripalu uh, Institute. He had a scandal and left Kripalu, but Kripalu carried on as an educational organization and became the, the biggest and most important uh, yoga retreat center in America. And it's still very popular today. This is Baba, Har Baba Haridas who came here as a, a, a sadhu in the 70s. Some Americans brought him over. He was a silent guru who never spoke. He would write on a slate. And they started a place called Mount Madonna in Northern California. And he lived and uh, had his devotees there and uh, up until just a few years ago when he passed. Here we have uh, BKS Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, both of whom were uh, disciples of uh, Krishnamacharya, the great uh, innovator and reformer of Hatha Yoga. And they came in the 70s and really launched postural yoga, physical yoga, the yoga, asana oriented yoga in a big way and trained many, many hundreds of Americans to be yoga teachers and are largely responsible for why yoga, Hatha yoga is so popular now in America. And the, of course, the downside of that is that here in the, in the West, uh, people now think of yoga as physical exercise. And uh, even though they would not like it to be known as only physical exercise, that was the one of the side effects of their emphasis on asana practice and proper execution of the, the uh, repertoire of hatha yoga, stretching and bending and postures. This is Swami Rama, who, oops, sorry who came in the 60s and famously was a participant in studies done at the Menninger Clinic, where they heard that yogis were able to control physical processes with their minds. And he was a subject of their experiments. And out of that came the Western practice known as biofeedback. And Swami Rama started uh, the Himalayan Institute, left behind important books and a yoga uh, retreat and a yoga training centers in Pennsylvania that still exists. 
this is this <laughs> next to him i don't know how many of you know prem rawat but he came here as a 13 year old representing a small lineage in northern india uh family lineage and he was he was held up as the 13 year old perfect master and the 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 new uh, savior the new uh, <laughs> messiah and after a few years said you know i don't really like this i don't want to be treated this way and fell in love with an american flight attendant who was older than he was and decided to not be treated as the perfect guru but wanted to be a householder and so he his family denounced him and returned to india and he when i was researching american veda i thought whatever happened to him well he's still alive and he was teaching as prem rawat all those years but not as a guru with disciples but just as a, a teacher and he would he was been teaching business people and that sort of thing all these many decades and raising a family in california and next to him is shri chinmoy who was a devotee of uh, shri orbindo and lived at uh, in pondicherry at, at the orbindo ashram as a young man and then came to america and he had any number of disciples uh, at his center in new york and uh, his uh, influence was was smaller but than some of the others but important and uh, still exists and those were the principal teachers of the 60s and 70s and their legacy continues and i want to give a shout out to some of the um the great masters of india who had a big impact on america but never came here they had an impact because of westerners who uh, became devotees of theirs or wrote books about them or brought back their writings or translated them and maybe started teaching in their name or because they sent uh, uh indian teachers to to the west uh, of course you all know ramana maharshi and sri aurobindo both of whom died in 1950 and were very widely known in india but very little known in the west during their lifetimes but now are very well known because of the westerners who carried on uh, their made their work known uh, i won't go into all the details but they they their importance should not be underemphasized this of course is krishna macharya already spoke about his influence in training people like ayengar and patabi joyce and others who came to the west this is neem karoli baba who was a a hermit guru in uh northern india when uh he was discovered by the person we'll meet soon who was a harvard professor richard alpert who became a devotee of of Neem Karoli Babas and took on the name Ramdas and became the most famous and well-known American to be uh, carrying on and representing these teachings and other important western figures in the early 70s before Neem Karoli died in 73 or 4 uh were in, deeply influenced by him and came back to america to uh uh in one way or another propagate the important teachings of india that they learned this is ananda moy ma who also never came here but is beloved was of course a beloved saint in india but because of uh, yogananda and other people who talked about her and wrote about her and uh, some of the americans who were lucky enough to spend time with her before she passed she too is uh 
remains popular and well known in America. And this is Swami Shivananda, whose ashram in Rishikesh is still a very powerful uh, influence, and who sent people like Satchitananda and Vishnu Devananda to the West to represent uh, traditional yoga. Now, that tradition of masters and uh, acharyas coming here is still very strong. These are just four of the current teachers who come to America very often and have many thousands of devotees and people who go to see them and learn from them and go to India to be with them. This, of course, is a uh, woman we know of as Amma, who before a pandemic would come to the West every year and you know hug thousands and thousands of people. Uh, this, of course, is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who is advertising my book. <laughs> he's, well, I, I would presented him with a copy when he was in L.A., and he's, he's actually looking at the photographs as one of, their, of me and him together. So he was looking at that. And you, know all, you all know these people. And this is Sadhguru, who I'm about to actually interview. He has a new book out about karma. And I'm one of the people interviewing him on his virtual book tour. So if you want to tune into that, it's next Thursday. If you go to uh, his website, I, I don't have the URL, but I'll be interviewing him live on, on Zoom about karma. And, and this is um, a Karunamai, who, another Amma, who also comes to the West a lot and has a big following in India. Now, so the gurus and swamis and yogacharyas, that's one of the, the most important stream through which the teachings came. But the other is the Westerners who were influenced by the teachings of India and absorbed them into their own lives, interpreted them in their own way, and incorporated the teachings, the ideas, and the pra in some cases the practices as well, into their own areas of expertise and then transmitted them to other Westerners. And in some cases, because they became famous to millions and millions of people. And in some cases, they, their uh, exposition of Vedanta, yogic ideas, uh, Hindu Dharma was explicit and intentional. And in other cases, it was much more subtle. They would absorb the teachings and just write books in their own areas of expertise or incorporate the ideas and practices into their own work. And it comes through in ways that sometimes it's not, it's, the source is not recognizable, but they influence millions and millions of people. So I'm going to give you a bit of a history of that because it goes back a long way. It goes back to the early and mid 19th century when long before Vivekananda came, before any gurus came, when it was the early translations and commentaries of books, I don't have to tell any of you the awful impact of the British colonial enterprise in India. But one thing came out of that, which was some of the, the Europeans who went to India to serve the empire were scholars 
who were assigned to try to understand Hinduism to make it easier for the missionaries to convert people and for the colonial uh, administrators to subjugate Indians, some of them realized how profound and important the Vedic texts were and thought, my goodness, we have a lot to learn from the Indian tradition. And so they wrote commentaries and essays and journals and made translations that were, that were sympathetic and more accurate than what had preceded them. And those influences, those rare people, uh, had a big impact first on Europe, on Germans and British, on many of the most famous British philosophers and poets, on Germans like uh, uh, Schopenhauer and others. And that influence came to America. And there was also a direct link uh, between certain uh, people in New England and Boston area, which was the intellectual center of America at that time, and especially Bengal, and the legacy of the uh, what we call the you know the the Hindu Renaissance, the Bengal Re Renaissance, and people like Ram Mohan Roy, and later Vivekananda and the Ramakrishna lineage. All, all of that started to happen in the early and mid 19th century. And two of the most important people who received these books and were illuminated by them and read them and wrote about them were Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Some of you know who they were, many of you probably don't. But in America, they're household words, they're household names. And every young person reads some of Emerson and Thoreau's writings to this day as part of their schooling. And they were hugely impacted by it. In Thoreau's most famous work, Walden, he, talk, he, said, he, he talks about reading the Gita every day and how important it was. And Emerson as well wrote about the Vedas and, and the Gita and incorporated those ideas into his philosophy, you know, what people think of as Emersonian philosophy. But you see the traces of it uh, in, in his essays and in his poems. And sometimes it's very explicit where he extols the virtue of the Vedic text. In other cases, you could see the influence, but it's just part of his own uh, thinking process. Like he writes about karma, but he calls it his, the laws of compensation. I, I, I could talk about both of them forever, but suffice it to say their impact was enormous and it continues to this day. And in the late part of the 19th century, a movement called the New Thought came to be. It was a sort of Western metaphysics, but it incorporated sort of esoteric ideas from Europe, certain streams of Christianity, Christian mysticism, and what they were able to absorb from India. This is Madame Blavatsky who started the Theosophists. This is Mary Baker Eddy who started something called Christian Science. This is the, the Fillmores who started the Unity Churches. And this is later in the 20th century, a man named Ernest Holmes who started a, something called Science of Mind. All of them were hugely impacted by the teachings of India and incorporated it into their own sort of brand of Western metaphysical teaching and practical application of these ideas in how to be have a better life, how to have spiritual enrichment, and so forth. You all know about the influence of theosophy because 
they of the impact they had on India and the freedom movement. But the others have an even bigger influence on America and to this day persist in their, you know, the, the lineages and institutions they started. Then later, you have different categories of Americans. This is the group I think of as the public intellectuals. Academics, not, well, in some cases academics, in some cases non-academics, but public thinkers who through their books and, and lectures became very famous, all of whom were, had a strong foundational uh, foundation in both Buddhism and Hinduism and translated them in, in their own languages and in their own areas of expertise and had a big influence. This is Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley, this is Houston Smith. Aldous Huxley was a great popular philosopher, author of, of fiction and nonfiction. Houston Smith was the most prominent scholar of religion in the 20th century in America. Joseph Campbell was a, a, an academic, but a huge public figure and best-selling author. Uh, of, uh, who studied the world's uh, religious traditions and, and especially the world's mythologies, what we would think of as Puranas, <laughs> all this, the great storytelling of the world. And he would, he would find the commonalities in it. All three of these people, when they were young and unknown, well, not in Huxley's case, Huxley was already a, a well-known British thinker, were... Uh, studied with Vedanta Society swamis in the Vivekananda lineage from that Ramakrishna mission lineage in America. And in Huxley's case in Los Angeles, in Houston's case in, in, in St. Louis, and Campbell's case in New York. And that, that had a formative influence on their subsequent thinking and all their subsequent work. And they were very explicit about it. Huxley was one of the people, along with the novelist Christopher Isherwood, who worked with Swami Prabhavananda on a series of books published. And they started a publishing company called the Vedanta Press out of the Vedanta Society here in America. And those books, their translation of the Gita, their translation of Shankara, their Yoga Sutra translation, their anthologies of Westerners writing about Vedanta had an enormous influence. They're the first books I read when I first got interested in this in the 60s. Enormously influential. Houston Smith wrote a textbook on the world's religions that you know has sold millions of copies and is read by students all over the world. And it's a very Vedantic uh, way of looking at the world's religions, very explicitly so. I was lucky enough to, to know him, and he wrote the foreword or the introduction to American Veda, uh, which I was honored by. This is Alan Watts, who had been a, a, a Christian minister and then discovered the teachings of the East and became a very popular and... <laughs> and uh, a character and public speaker and brilliant author. You can, you can see uh, uh, videos of many of these people, especially Alan Watts and audios and videos on, on, online. Uh, he had an enormous influence translating and, and writing about uh, first Zen Buddhism and later Vedanta and yoga as well. And this is Ken Wilbur, who I wanted a more contemporary person. He's a person of my generation, a very important public thinker who was deeply influenced by Buddhism and Hinduism and, and uh, people like Sri Aurobindo and has created something he calls integral philosophy, which to this day is having a, a big impact. So these are the public thinkers. And I can't, under, I can't overestimate 
how important they were uh, and continue to be, but especially uh, in, in the era when people my age were young seekers. Also, the teachings influenced scientists. Wait, this is the wrong one. Yeah, okay. Uh, these are psychologists, very famous psychologists, who were, you know, in the course of studying what the mind is and what consciousness is and how to help people live better lives, discovered the teachings of India and incorporated it into their work. This is the, the sort of founder of uh, American psychology, uh, William James, who knew Vivekananda, because he was at Harvard. Vivekananda came and spoke in, at Harvard, and they knew each other. It's said that William James offered Vivekananda a job teaching at Harvard, and Vivekananda turned him down. And this is uh, Carl Jung, who uh, many of you have heard of, uh, who was a huge, uh, Im uh, hugely important psychologist who broke away from Sigmund Freud, largely because he took spirituality seriously and investigated uh, yogic teachings and, and uh, Indian philosophy and brought out many of the ideas in his work. And this is a later psychologist who in the, named Abraham Maslow, who in the 60s, along with a bunch of other people, including St Stanislav Grof and Charles Tart and Richard Alpert, they were all part of a, a group of young psychologists who were searching for something more than psychology at that time could um, explain and understand. And in their discovery, in their searching, the ideas born in the you know, ancient days of India and came through in modern terms in, in the 20th century became very important. And they elevated psychology away from just the exclusive study of uh, mental problems and abnormalities uh, and uh, change the way we understand what human beings are and what we're capable of. And new schools of psychology came out of that, humanistic psychology, transpersonal psychology, and now even ordinary mainstream psychology treats the spiritual dimension of life much more seriously than it used to and brings in yogic practices as part of uh, psychotherapy. This is part of the legacy of the discoveries of the 60s and 70s. Physicians, I, some, I don't know what happened to my slide with the physicists, but I, I'll just say it. Uh, very important physicists, hard scientists, going back to Nikola Tesla, who was a friend of Vivekananda's, and Werner Heisenberg, who's uncertainty principle, and Erwin Schrodinger, one of the early quantum physicists, and others, in their exploring the nature of reality and the nature of the cosmos, found that the ideas of Vedanta were compatible with what they were finding in physics. Just last night, I was at a, 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 an event uh, uh, with a, where one of the speakers was a physicist named John Hagelin, who, like me, had studied with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, only he's continued, and he runs the university that Maharshi started. And he was, he's a ph physicist, a well-trained physicist, and he was bringing out certain parallels between uh, the latest discoveries in physics and Vedic teachings. So this kind of enterprise has also been going on, and it affected medicine. Some of these people... like 
Dean Ornish here. Dean Ornish was a disciple of Swami Satchidananda when he was a young troubled medical student and Satchidananda changed his life. And Satchidananda's yogic protocols, Ornish converted into medical practice to treat uh, heart disease especially and became very famous because of it. This is Dr. Oz who has a huge television following and occasionally talks about the importance of yoga and meditation because he learned about it from Dean Ornish. This, of course, is Deepak Chopra, who is so famous now as a sort of spiritual teacher that people forget he, was, he started out as a doctor. He was an endocrinologist looking for answers to you know, personal questions about life. And he, too, met Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. And Marshi said, you should study Ayurveda. And he did, and, and they, you know, became famous and now, you know, became Deepak. But what the important thing is, at a certain point, as I mentioned earlier, practices like meditation were studied by scientists. And they were found to have a very good effect on measurable physiological processes like lowering blood pressure and other things and in psychology on the uh, the treatment of depression and anxiety and people were getting off of medication to practice meditation instead this happened this started in the 70s and it just grew in acceptability as the data came out and the data grew and the methodology of studying them got more sophisticated to the point where now healthcare providers have, you know, tell people to practice yoga and to meditate and they have instructions and they have yoga rooms and all that. And this was, I, I assure you, when I was a young seeker, if you told somebody you start your day with meditation, they thought you were crazy. And now <clears throat> it's just acceptable and it's almost like a, a medical practice for reducing stress. Now there's a downside to this because in having somebody who's a psychotherapist teach a patient to meditate without proper training, just making something up, it, it has benefit, but it distorts the, the, the traditional practice. And the same is happening with Hatha Yoga. It's now, you know, it's a health practice. It's for your fitness. And the fullness of yoga, which you all, you know what I mean, is often lost. And the teachings get diluted and distorted. So the trade-off is they reach larger numbers of people, people who otherwise would never be exposed to these teachings, some of whom then go on to, you know, to, to be influenced in a bigger way than just you know, a health intervention. But on the other hand, there's the danger of losing the integrity of the teachings. And this is an ongoing issue that people like me who care about it uh, have to keep struggling with. How do you adapt these teachings to medicine, to psychotherapy, to ordinary lives of ordinary people where they could have such a value and yet not distort them or dilute them, keep them authentic? That's an ongoing challenge. And we'll move on. Uh, Oh, here are the physicists. I'm sorry, I got them out of order, but I talked about them. There, I also want to mention that uh, the teachings influenced a, a large number of Western religious leaders. These are three famous Catholic monks, Thomas Merton, Bede Griffiths, and uh, Father Thomas Keating all of whom embrace the teachings of the East, the Hindus and the Buddhist teachings and change their way of understanding Christianity. 
And they had a huge impact on American Christians. And you, there's a, a, a renaissance of different forms of Christianity, which are incorporating Hindu and Buddhist ideas and practices and bringing out the sort of mystical, essential core teachings through people like them. If you're ever in South India, uh, B. Griffiths ran an ashram, a Hindu Christian ashram uh, in, in somewhere in Tamil Nadu. Uh, he's long gone, but the, the ashram still exists. And he was a genuine uniter of those two traditions. You could see talks of his online. Thomas Keating started something called Centering Prayer, which is essentially mantra meditation converted into a form that he could teach to Christians and make it a Christian practice. That can be criticized. On the other hand, you can find in the uh, ancient Christian uh, mystical traditions, very similar practices. This is important, and there's Jewish equivalents. There's a guy called the Kirtan Rabbi who leads Kirtan. You can Google him, and you'll see him leading Kirtan group in traditional Kirtan with uh, traditional instruments, but he's doing it in Hebrew instead of Sanskrit. There are people teaching Jewish meditation. They essentially are teaching like I, I was trained to teach mantra meditation in the in the uh, in a Vedanta in Advaita Vedanta lineage through Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. Well, they're doing something similar, using Hebrew instead of Sanskrit mantras. I know a rabbi I'm about to interview for my podcast, who is he's a rabbi, but he's a disciple of. Uh, in the Ramakrishna lineage. And he interprets his own Judaism through that lens. And I want to, I, I know we don't have much time, but I want to bring out that these teachings also came out through the arts. And this is hugely important. Certain artists in this slide, novelists, Herman Hesse, the German novelist, Somerset Maugham, the British novelist, J.D. Salinger, the American novelist, huge numbers of readers by the millions, all of whom brought into play Eastern ideas. Somerset Maugham, in one of his novels called The Razor's Edge, a term which comes from the Katha Upanishad, he has a guru figure that he modeled after Ramana Maharshi, who he went to visit about an American seeker. J.D. Salinger was a disciple of Swami Nikilananda at the Vedanta Society in New York, same as Joseph Campbell. And his writings about Amer young American seekers in 1950s brings in all these ideas of Vedanta and, and other uh, traditions. Had a big impact on me. Poets. Walt Whitman, the great American poet, read the literature of India and, and wrote poems like The Passage to India and talked about the great India. He never came to India, never met an Indian. He was just influenced by the books. T.S. Eliot, Summers, uh, I'm sorry, W.B. Yeats, these were class great poets of the early and mid 20th century. And Yeats actually worked with a Swami uh, in, in, in England uh, in a, some translations of Upanishads. And this is Allen Ginsberg, who was a latter-day uh, important American poet, who was also a bhakta and, and spent a lot of time with Srila Prabhupada and helped to popularize uh, kirtan in America. And music. In 1956, the great uh, Western violinist Yehudi Menuhin met Ravi Shankar in India and brought him to the West 
to do concerts. And this led to a chain of events that had a, an enormous impact on the West. First, Ravi Shankar became well-known and made classical Indian uh, music well-known in classical music circles in America. He and Yehudi Menuhin uh, wrote, uh, teamed up for an album called West Meets East that you can get online. Then jazz musicians in America started to hear about Indian music and some of them met Ravi Shankar, played with him, learned from him. The great saxophonist John Coltrane and his wife Alice named their son Ravi after Ravi Shankar. They became devotees. John died young. Alice later became a Swami. She became a devotee of uh, other gurus and had an ashram of her own in, in California. Paul Horn became one of the early followers of uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and uh, became a hugely uh, influential flutist. All of these things started to have an influence, but the big thing was when Ravi Shankar met George Harrison. And George wanted to learn the sitar, and Ravi Shankar became his friend and mentor. And the world changed because of this. I have to do this quickly because uh, I've given presentations that go 90 minutes just on this, <laughs> just on the Beatles. Because as a result of this influence, this relationship, the Beatles went to meet Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in London in 1967, learned his transcendental meditation. And this was on the front page of every newspaper in the world. Some of you are probably too young to have been around then, but the Beatles were the most famous people on the planet, with the exception maybe of, uh, you know, the American president or something. And a lot of young people did whatever the Beatles did. If they cut their hair, they cut their hair, they, you know. And when the Beatles took up meditation, and started saying, well, we, we, we don't do LSD anymore. We meditate to expand our consciousness. Young people all over the world wanted to do what they were doing. And I, I was one of them. And um, although I used to tell people, I, I took up meditation in spite of the Beatles, not because of them, because I, I, I didn't want to be looked at as a... <laughs> a conformist. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but I can't overestimate how important this was. When they first learned to meditate and then went to India to go on a long meditation retreat in Rishikesh with Maharishi and other celebrities like the young actress, then young actress Mia Farrow, and other uh, musicians were with them. It was on the cover of magazines like this, and there were many, many of them. It was big news. And people would say, why would the rich, rich famous young people like the Beatles go off to a, a, a uncomfortable ashram on the Ganges to meditate when they could go anywhere and do anything. And this led to a huge investigation of what's going on here. What is a guru? What is a mantra? What is meditation? What, is, what are these teachings? And they were all over the newspapers and everything. And all the young people wanted to try it out. And the teachings changed their lives like they changed mine. And so their parents took it seriously. And as I said earlier, the scientists took it seriously. And that led to the mainstreaming of meditation. And, and it all came out because the, these, the teachings changed the Beatles and changed their music and changed what they told young people. 
And fortunately, uh, scientists said, let's do studies. And then it reached the mainstream. And then another phenomenon happened as at around the same time. Westerners were trained and authorized by gurus to represent the teachings. There were always some. Yogananda had Western representatives and teachers he trained, Vivekananda did, but now it happened in a big way because of supply and demand. The demand for these teachings grew exponentially. People like Maharshi and Muktananda and Satchidananda, all these people said, I'll train Westerners because they'll know how to reach other Westerners and I'll train them to teach these practices and represent these teachings. I was one of them. Thousands of others were one of them. I'm singling out Ram Das because he was the most famous and most popular. He was older than my generation. He was already famous as a Harvard professor and a controversial figure in the study of uh, LSD uh, uh, and the consciousness. And when he went to India, he was just a scientist trying to understand consciousness and transformational practices and met Neem Karoli Baba and became a devotee and changed his name and began teaching as Ram Das. And there were many, many others in that light. And some of them were Hatha Yoga teachers. This is Indra Devi who was uh, Krishna Macharya broke with tradition and trained a Western woman to teach his Hatha Yoga practices. These are some of the other Hatha Yoga teachers who were famous in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and they helped put, you know, some of them had TV shows and they put yoga on the map. And out of that came, you know, the first publications, Yoga Journal and the training of American yoga teachers. And, and of, again, an enormous positive effect. I can't. I'm somebody. Um, is somebody speaking to me? I I don't know. No, no, no. It just you okay. know, Mike. Uh, say oh, okay. So again, the po on the positive side, this these trends brought yoga and yogic ideas and Vedantic ideas and meditation into the mainstream in enormous numbers. The downside is the danger of the teachings becoming trivialized and distorted and oversimplified for commercial use. This is an ongoing issue. I tend to think of it all that the, in the end, the teachings are so powerful and enough people care about the essence of the teachings that that will prevail in the long run. Now, Bhakti, as I mentioned earlier, back in the 60s and 70s, the only uh, kirtan, the only public bhakta Bhakti was uh, the Hare Krishna people. Now, kirtan festivals and kirtan concerts and evenings are enormously, well, they were before the pandemic and will be again afterward. And another important thing I just want to mention briefly. In 1965, American uh, immigration laws changed. And for the first time, people from India and other parts of Asia could become American citizens and emigrate here. That changed a lot in America. It made it possible for gurus like the ones we mentioned to come here more often and stay more often and establish residency. But it also meant there's now a few million Indian people living in America and now second and third generation Americans, born Americans of Hindu descent. And that led, as it did, you know, with previous immigrant groups to the building of temples 
and the establishment of Hindu organizations to uh, protect the rights of Hindu Americans and to uh, propagate the, the Hindu teachings to younger generations of uh, people born here in America. This is an example of one of the early temples built in uh, California. Um, and many of them are, you know, were built with Indian artisans coming to build them in traditional style. Others, like the one I was at last night, were just uh, converted buildings where the interior is, has more of a temple feel, but the exterior is just a, a, an American building. Uh, but this is very important. The advent uh, in America of uh, citizens of Indian descent, of Hindu Americans, now 30, 40, 50 years on, many of them prominent, one of whom is the vice president of America. I mean, Kamala Harris's mother came from Tamil Nadu, you know, and this is a very important thing uh, in the integration of the teachings into American mainstream life. Because, you know, young Hindu people go to school with young Christians and Jews and Muslims. They marry one another they work with one another. And this is one of the ways that these ideas get into the bloodstream of America. There are two types of America, you said, right? Uh, and we have also the picture of two types of America. On popular culture, uh, we see that yoga and Vedanta is accepted. It became big, it became movement and all that. Of course, it's fascinating journey. I think every Indian must know about this, that how this happened in last 100 year and all that. But what about academics? You know, we do not see uh, in American academia, the same picture of transformation of India's wisdom that is happening on the ground. So is academia disconnected with all these transformation or there is some other parameters they go through? Um, the, uh, two things I have to say. First, I have to say, I'm not an academic. So I'm not in university. And, um, but I, I had to do my research. So I know a lot of academics in this field, in the field of religious studies, in the field of Hinduism, uh, teaching Hindu, Hinduism courses, teaching South Asian philosophy and that sort of thing. I know a lot of those people. I've gone to conferences. Uh, I'm honored that uh, many of them take American Vedas seriously and have their students read it. And, so, and some of them are, are good friends. I would have them answer your question because they're right in there in academic life and reading academic journals and all that. But I will say one important thing. There are many more academics who are like me. I mean, if I had stayed in graduate school, I'd be one of them, <laughs> but I didn't. And, um, and I, I was with one last night. Uh, a, a scholar named Christopher Chapel, who's, you know, done translation of the Yoga Vashishta and the Yoga Sutras. And he started the first master's degree program in America uh, in yoga studies and tr has a, a, a institute that has at his small college for training yoga therapists. He was a disciple of a lesser known guru as a young man in the 70s, and as a, a practitioner and an academic. There are many people like him. They're outnumbered, and, and of course, and they are, um, in some cases, highly respected because they're both practitioners and scholars. And in some cases, 
dismissed from being taken seriously because they're devotees or practitioners as well as scholars. It, it's an ongoing uh, hypocrisy as far as I'm concerned. But I, uh, the positive message here is there are many more people. I have a friend who teaches at a college in Texas, teaches comparative religion, uh, what, you know, different courses. He was a close devotee of Swami Muktananda. And he teaches these and he, with great respect and reverence and accuracy. There's a guy at Rutgers who was a devotee of Srila Prabhupada, and he also is teaching. There's a, another devotee of Srila Prabhupada who just had a new translation of the Gita come out. And so there are many, many people. Rita Sharma, who's of Hindu descent, started a, the, uh, a Hindu theology program at a very... Uh, a uh, prestigious theological seminary in California. So there's a lot of good work being done to counteract the trend that you are familiar with. Now, how big an impact that has on the larger academic community, on the, you know, the, the people who have misconceptions or prejudices and biases and, you know, anti- Indian attitudes, Hindophobic attitudes, I don't know. But I do know <coughs> there are more good things happening in academia than you might be aware of. And I need to let you know that. More, more people who you would be happy to be representing these teachings, some of whom are people of Indian descent. And, and it is the hope of some of my, my friends who... Uh, value these teachings and understand the problems of uh, academic treatment of them, it is some of them are hoping that young uh, Americans of, of Hindu descent will go to graduate school to study these things and become professors. And not just uh, physicians and engineers. <laughs> and, and so you, you may have in the future people of Indian descent, Hindus, you know, people raised in, in, in the Hindu tradition also being professors, representing them, just like Christians teach Christian theology in, in graduate school. So you may have more of that in the future. There's already some of it, uh, but you'll, you'll no doubt have more. So I, I'm hopeful, but I understand the problem. And uh, I have one more question uh, regarding Prabhu Padji. You know, you mentioned that you know uh, Americans are indolent mind. They you know they were uh, thinking logically. They were looking for reasons and all those things. And the whole Guru's spectrum that you have covered in you know, last 150 years, I think Prabhu Padji is somewhat exception. In yes. the sense that he he brings bhakti tradition to America, yes. where he uh, does not shy away from, you know, <laughs> having traditional attire, you know, shaving your head and all those things. Yes. So how did it appeal to Americans at that time? <laughs> <laughs> well, most Americans just found them annoying. Because they were in the streets a lot, it, you know, it was the late sixties and they were out there, you know, they'd show up at a park, they'd be in the airports in the days when, you know, there was less security and they would be selling their trans Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and selling incense and trying to convert people and, and all that. And many people found them annoying. Even a lot of young people found them annoying. I used to go and chant with them when I was young and living in New York from time to time. And I would go on Sundays because they had free food. You know, they always had this prasad. <laughs> so I would go and eat Indian food for free. And, but, and it was, it was fun and it was ecstatic, but, 
but because the devotees were so um, they were young and enthusiastic and and they could their enthusiasm could be annoying and and because they were shaving their heads and wearing saffron clothing and being vegetarians and all that sort of thing that didn't it seemed strange to americans so they were not taken very seriously and then over time they all you know people they grew up Prabhupada passed they realized you know if, if they're going to have a job and raise children they they should let their hair grow back and wear normal clothing and they stopped being annoying in public. And that's when people started to realize, oh, wait a minute. And some academics, you know, did, you know, they said, well, what, what is this Gaudiya Vaishnavite tradition? And they started taking it more seriously and learning about it. And the understanding of, of, of bhakti came about. But at first it was just annoying and it was a hippie thing and it was fun. But um, I, I'll tell you a funny thing. Uh, when I became a, a teacher of uh, transcendental meditation, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, because he, he, he had to train hundreds and hundreds of us to meet the demand after the Beatles. So he trained us. And it was very rigorous training for many months. But if you were going to teach his form of meditation, if you were going to represent him in public, you had to shave and you had to cut your hair, and you had to put on a suit and tie, because he didn't want us looking like hippies, and he didn't want us being confused with the Hare Krishnas. And we used to say, people think we're weird because we're teaching meditation, and we're, we're wearing this costume, <laughs> you know, business suits and all that. And we used to think, we're really glad the Hare Krishnas are there because they make us look normal. <laughs> and so by comparison, and we used to joke with each other about this. But that's the way it was. And, you know, you know things change now. <laughs> uh, really very good, I think. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I had a question uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, it, we often feel, you know, that uh, the number of people in America who are uh, who have been influenced by these various gurus is uh, obviously a lot, as you have shown, and their influence is often not known, you know. And on the other hand, there's also a group of people who are uh, often uh, 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 misrepresenting uh, Hinduism or mischaracterizing Hinduism, and also, as you see in the uh, especially in the textbooks, uh, you know, in the California textbooks or uh, various other textbooks that are there in America on Hinduism, you know, and somehow it appears uh, to an outsider, like non-American audience, that uh, these people who have influence in uh, drafting textbooks and uh, in various other public discourse on India are somehow more influential uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, shaping public discourse as compared to people who have been uh, uh, devotees uh, as you have been showing. So uh, how do you explain this, uh, uh, this uh, apparent paradox? I don't know. Um, bec I think part of it is, has to do with uh, media in America. It's, it's a lot easier to get attention if you're critical if you're pointing out a problem. So if you're writing about India, you'll get more attention if you write about poverty and, and you know, the, 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 the issue of, of uh, the Dalits and, and that sort of thing, because it, it, you know, it's attention getting. Whereas if you, if you write about uh, you, 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 the newspapers and, and television broadcast news is not going to take uh, do a feature on Vedanta philosophy or something. And now, even you know, if uh, 
some famous actor or singer went to live in an ashram like the Beatles did, it wouldn't be front page news anymore. It just is not, it's not going to be that newsworthy. When Julia Roberts made uh, that movie, Eat, Pray, Love, and, and said how she's drawn to Hinduism and goes to temples and all that, it got some attention. But it was a little article on page four or five. It was not like the, when the Beatles went. So that's that doesn't get attention. When uh, when Amma comes or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar comes and does public lectures, it's not a big deal in America anymore. It's not going to get that attention. But if you write an expose about some political problem in India or you know any anything as you know what i'm saying you'll it'll get attention and that's that's part of the issue but and also the the misunderstandings and you know um it it's it takes a while i you know my, i have friends indian american friends who've been working on the textbook issue for 15 years or more and it, it just takes time and you just have to keep hammering away but i'll tell you if you look at american television through this last year of the pandemic a lot of the authority figures you see speaking about public health and medicine are people with indian names they're prominent doctors prominent research scientists. There are American politicians, Congress people, members of Congress with Indian names, they, you know, people like Kamala Harris, whose parents came here as immigrants. This has an impact. And over time, those people, even if they're not philosophers, even if they're not journalists, they, they start to have an influence. There, you can be, it's easier for advocates of, say, textbook change or uh, other forms of uh, discrimination to be heard in Congress now because there are people of Indian descent in Congress. So things change. But I think a big part of it is what gets attention. So right now, there's a lot of attention on, on what's going on in India with COVID. And, you know, and it deserves that attention. And I, I you know, there's people raising money for India here in America, and, and it's getting that kind of attention. But because, and, and in India's political situation gets a lot of attention. And you could, you know, depending on your point of view, a lot of that attention is incorrect or misguided. Some of it is accurate. It's very hard to know from here. But the sensational things, a riot, an upheaval, a protest, you know, that gets attention. Not, you know, uh, Right. And what will also get attention is the large numbers of people doing yoga. That that became that was newsworthy every once in a while. But but that um, when we can only do what we can do, you know. And I, you know, I have a small platform and I blog and I have a podcast. But it's only one small contribution, and other people are making their contributions, and you hope that it changes over time. Right. So I have one more question, uh, that when we talk about Eastern wisdom, compared to you know, Chinese or Japanese philosophy, uh, which yeah. might have also impacted America in last century. Yes. Uh, so can you do, you know, can you share some comparison, how, you know, where it, how to evaluate that and what happened to them? Taoism has, has, has some popularity here, but Taoist, we don't have the same 
phenomenon of Taoist teachers coming to America, the way we had uh, Hindu swamis come and uh, uh, Buddhist teachers from Japan and Buddhist teachers from uh, Tibet and, and so forth. We just didn't, you don't have that many Chinese teachers coming to teach Taoism partly because of the history of China and the, you know, Taoism being suppressed by the communists and, and, and you know, the Cold War and all the rest of it. But certain uh, Taoist texts like the Tao Te Ching and uh, the philosopher Chuang Tzu were translated and were especially popular in the 60s and 70s and People like Alan Watts would uh, write a, books about that and bring Taoist ideas in. And the Tao Te Ching uh, was pretty popular, maybe still is, different translations of it. But that's about it. And people, can, people recognize, uh, if you read the Tao Te Ching or Chuang Tzu, you see overtones into... Uh, classical Buddhism, classic Advaita Vedanta, classic yoga philosophy. So you, you often see writers mixing them up. They'll throw in a, a quote from the Tao Te Ching and a quote from uh, the Upanishads or something to show, you know, this is Eastern wisdom, essentially. It's non-duality is, is essentially the, 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 uh, the, tie that binds them all together. This, you know, the, the oneness, the, the, um, the contiguous identity of the, the, in, the self, uh, our, the self of Atman and the self of the universe. You know, Atman is Brahman. That you get that in one way or another in Taoism as well. And so you could bring it out there, but it, it just didn't have the same impact. Indirectly, maybe, because Zen Buddhism from Japan had a big impact on America, and that comes from China. You know, the Japanese took... Chuan uh, with, uh, and Chuan Buddhism, the words Zen and Chuan, I think I'm pronouncing it right, come from the word Dian. So they're the yes. meditation oriented. So, you know, you have seen the whole spectrum and you were insider, you were part of this transformation and all that. So if I ask you that which technique of transforming oneself appealed most to Americans when it come from India, like it's Vedanta and yoga, particularly if you have to select. Yeah, Vedanta, Vedanta philosophy, whether they know it or not, Vedanta philosophy has influenced many, many people. Yoga philosophy as well, but as you know, they're very, you know, they, they go together. So I always say, it's, you know, the philosophy of Vedanta and the practices of yoga are the main things that come. And among the practices of yoga, if you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have said the various forms of meditation were the most important. Now, in terms of numbers, it's hatha yoga, it's asana based. Uh, and I, we, you know, many of us are hoping that that's balance is restored uh, and people stop thinking of yoga only as uh, asana practice. And, uh, that would be a shame, you know, and so people, you know, try to bring out the, the fullness of, you know, classical Patanjali yoga wherever we can, but those, that's what has had the biggest impact. And because of the phenomena I mentioned to you, you know, people like Emerson and Huxley and all these people and the doctors, even, you know, Deepak. Deepak's a, a teacher of Vedanta, you know, and he, but he doesn't necessarily 
use the same language because he's, he's, he Americanizes the language. So people are influenced by this. They were influenced by Oprah Winfrey. You know, she's often espousing Vedantic ideas, but she, you know, she just puts it in American terms. I know people who are, you know, they have meditation practices. And when you ask them about their spirituality, they talk about, you know, the inner self and union with the divine. And they, where'd they get it? They got it from a, a psychologist, you know, not necessarily a guru, but they don't, they don't necessarily understand that what they're getting is, you know, from the Upanishads. They may never open a, an Upanishad in their lives, but they're hearing the message and they're absorbing it. Uh, one says, last... what about... <laughs> What's that? Uh, no, that's not, that's not the complication. And the student was asking about the influence of Jainism uh, is, is there any influence of Jainism on America? Not that much, but I can tell you, I know uh, scholars now who are writing about and studying and teaching courses on Jainism, which you didn't have much of in the past. Um, uh, there's a scholar named Jeffrey Long, who's a disciple in the Ramakrishna Vivekananda lineage tradition, has written a lot about Hinduism. Now he's writing about Jainism. Uh, so is uh, Dr. Christopher Chapel, who teaches uh, here in LA, uh, who I mentioned earlier. He does a lot of work with, with the Jain community as well. So there is people starting to hear about Jainism more than we ever did in the past. But it's small. Uh, when you go to India, and uh, do you see the paradox here that, you know, Indians are becoming more like American in the oh. sense of adopting the <laughs> adopting the practices of America? And oh, Americans yeah. and that they are becoming like yogi and they are adopting the spiritual practices of India. It's, so, I find it, uh, frankly, I, I have to tell you, I find it sometimes very sad when I see, um, I think I mentioned earlier when American Veda came out in India, I did a speaking tour and um, the people sponsoring the tour had me speak to uh, schools a lot. And they were very explicit. They saw if you could tell them what's going on in, you know, what the, this whole American Veda story and how so many uh, Americans uh, benefit from traditional Indian teachings, they'll listen to you, meaning me, more than they'll listen to their parents and their school teachers because you're American. And I, I thought, that's not right. I shouldn't be here telling them that their tradition has something wonderful to offer and that I'm grateful for it and all that. They shouldn't need me to do that. I'm not even famous. I'm not George Harrison, you know, and, <laughs> but they said, no, no, please do this because they'll listen. And um, I, I found it almost sad, but then I realized I did the same thing. I didn't listen to my parents. I listened to a guru from India. I listened to a hippie, you know, who knew something I didn't. And so, you know, people, what to, I think one of the things I notice is that um, I remember being in India in 2001. I was there for the big Kuma Mela and there was a big, article in the one of the Del newspapers in Delhi that essentially said yoga is good for you discovery and I'm thinking am I in India they have to do big stories that yoga is good for you and what was the proof western scientists and American celebrities do it 
And I thought, I guess, you know, that's one of the reasons the gurus came to America. I remember Maharshi, when, when he became so famous, people said, why you spend so much time in the West, India, if your teachings are so good, you know, doesn't India need you? He said, India will listen to these messages more when Western scientists validate them. And he was right. And, and, and I just, it's, it's sad in a way, but it's also understandable. But, um, and I, so after a while, when I was on that speaking tour, I, I started to feel more confident. And I, I would say to people, look, if you want to do, if you want to imitate Americans, don't eat our junk food. Your food is much healthier, your traditional food. Don't drink Coca-Cola. Certainly don't smoke cigarettes. Don't adopt American lifestyles and, and drink too much and eat bad foods and, you know, think you're going to be happy if you, uh, you know, just follow the latest music trends and wear blue jeans. Follow the Americans like me who take your tradition seriously and incorporate them into our lives. So I hope people listen. <laughs> but, and I hope that young people in India are practical enough to say maybe, you know, traditional teachings can be adapted to our modern way of life. And I don't have to be like grandma, but I can take what's good about these teachings and adapt them to my modern life like the people in the West do. I hope that people do that and just don't become uh, materialistic and end up with stress-related diseases like Americans. Exactly. But, exactly. As you mentioned, you know, there are two types Americans, the two type of people in America, the similar is here. We have two type of Indians here. One yeah. who are thoroughly westernized, educated, and yeah. one who are still deeply rooted in dharma. Fortunate thing is uh, still the maximum number of people are still rooted in dharma. Uh, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, they are not, you know, educated in modern sense. Okay. So that's why they could escape from all this thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so your book, I think, is helping people to understand not only uh, India better, but even America, to look America in from different perspectives. Okay. I hope so. So we have, yes. So we have seen, you know, America only from prism of, you know, materialism, uh, you know, all sort of is ideologies that are coming out from there. And uh, as you know, India has been colonized by British and we, our minds are still colonized and we feel guilt about everything, you know, related to tradition, culture and all those things. And so there are two perspectives. On one hand, we see India as primitive, superstitious and all that. On the other hand, we see in you know, America as materialistic and all those things. But your book brings you in a clear perspective that it's not white and black. Things are in gray. Okay. So you can look America from yogic perspective also. And they have been following yoga, meditation. Mm -hmm. And that's why that, you know, uh, that's why it makes sense uh, why yoga can become international day. It's yes. precisely because what happened in last 150 years. So we don't know the journey. We are not aware about the journey of all these gurus and the, you know, the impact they created in, you know, global mind, uh, on global mind. So uh, I think uh, this is very important. Let, let me just so, add to that. Um, hmm. America and, well, Europe in general, we, we underneath it all, is a very pragmatic approach to life. If something works, if it holds up to evidence, eventually people come around. 
So meditation, yoga, all this stuff seemed weird and strange and to some people were hostile toward it. But over time, it turned out to have a good effect on people's lives and people came around. And now doctors recommend these things, you know. And so event, I think that the, the modern Indian is also very pragmatic. And, the, you know, when they see that the teachings they, rec they rejected as superstitious and old fashioned actually can have a good value. Like, I was, I, the thing I was at last night was the start of an Ayurvedic Institute here in LA. When people realize Ayurveda has value, when they realize yogic asanas and pranayama methods and meditation have value, and you, you can use these methods in modern life to enhance your career and your marriage and everything else. All the gurus recognize that. One of the interesting things about doing my Yogananda biography was watching him come here and talking about, you know, ideas and practices and then realizing how, what Americans were interested in and changing the titles of his talks. So, so it was like, oh, wait, Americans want a better career. Americans want better health. I'll introduce these ideas by saying you can have better health and you can, <laughs> it's the same teachings, it just changed. Same with Maharshi. Maharshi was, he came here in the, in the fifties and, and he was talking about, uh, you know, moksha and higher consciousness and different stages of consciousness. There's a great story. One of his first lecture in America, he's talking about all, you know, all this stuff. And in the Q&A, someone says, will your meditation help me sleep? And he says, yeah, it probably will. And the headline the next day was, Yogi says meditation cures insomnia. And all the rest of it, all the philosophy, all, everything else was not. And he realized that that's, that's what Americans are like. And if you can get the foot in the door by saying you'll have better health. And while you're here, let me introduce you to the, the rest of it. It became a, a, a good strategy and they all did it. All the gurus did it. You know, so there, there's the example. <laughs> that's why uh, that's why you mentioned your call. So we were, uh, I think in the chapter, is it? that it was experience oriented and belief oriented. It did not yeah. threaten non-believers with nation and tent was so wide. It could accommodate people of any faith or no faith. And then you also mentioned that Yog Vedanta is a kind of empirical science of the inner life. That's right. So you, its postulate can be tested in the laboratory of one's own consciousness using the test tubes and Bunsen burners of yogic disciplines. So I think that perfectly summarizes. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was a, that, that aspect of it was terribly important to uh, my generation and others. It was like, we didn't want to be told what to do. We didn't want to be told we had to believe in something that didn't seem believable to us. That's what regular religion was. And we said, no, no, thank you. We don't want that. And when the, when the gurus and the people writing about uh, Vedanta said, you don't have to believe this, test it out, expose it to reason and evidence, I said, oh, okay, that I can do. And that, that was a very important thing. In, in my, and when I met Maharshi and he said, you know, just be yourself, you know, ask questions, do, you know, follow your own dharma, that... That concept was very important to, to, to me. Yes. Uh, I actually am running out of time. I just looked at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> and I and so we are thoroughly enjoying this, you know, discussion. But still, you know, uh, we have the time limit also. And you are also running out of time. So it's time to say, you know, thank you. Thank you really very much for taking out time, accepting our invitation and talking about this wonderful journey of, you know, 
uh, 300 years or particularly for you know 150 years uh, from swami vivekananda and making us realize making indians realize that what they have contributed in modern times to on global arena because otherwise it looks that we have been importing things only basically we are importing ideologies you know most of the time these days but we are not exporting anything uh, because you know, because of inferiority complex that we are suffering from but your book make yes please please i know i assure you india has been exporting for a long long time and uh, the the products of your exports have been there's there are millions of us who are extremely grateful for it and who consider india our spiritual home in many ways you know when i take tour groups there it's a, it's a pilgrimage for many of them um who have been influenced by these teachings but you know want to see india want to see the ashrams want to see the temples want to meet the gurus and uh india's export it's not like you know exporting automobiles it's less visible it's more subtle and it's 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 more of a miracle that um that the exports have gone as far as they have and continue to it's uh it's terribly important that people appreciate that and know how much people like me appreciate that the people of india somehow managed through all the years of uh british rule and and the muslim rule before that to keep these teachings alive that's pretty miraculous in itself So thank you thank you for the invitation the opportunity to give something back to India and to wear the clothes I bought at Fab India last time I was there <laughs> and yeah, I like the opportunity and uh, I uh, as you said then on time for getting I think uh, I would like to mark it here also that this is book that every indian every hindu must read this is the most comprehensive account of how india's you know the spiritual wisdom influenced america or you know uh, europe and there is no other book i am sure that no other book on such comprehensive encyclopedic scale written where you will find all the journey of gurus uh, those who created impact on american people and uh, uh, of vedanta yoga bhakti tradition so this is the book which every indian must read to understand how india is still continuously influencing the western world through its spirituality